All right, we will go ahead and get started. Uh, this is 3 o'clock. Um, I just want to welcome everyone first to the How to Start a Canvas Kitchen info session. Uh, my name is Matt Schnarr, and I'm the Expansion and Partnerships Manager here at the Canvas Kitchens Project. And so in this presentation, we're first going to hear a little bit just briefly about what exactly a Canvas Kitchen is and what they typically do. Um, and then we're going to learn about how to start a Canvas Kitchen of your own, um, which will be the main focus of the info session, where we're going to learn about the benefits of having one on your campus, as well as how to actually bring that about. Um, and then we'll conclude the webinar with plenty of time for Q&A, either um, out loud or through the chat box. Um, so if you do have any questions throughout the um, info session, feel free to write them in the chat box, and I can get to them then, or definitely get to them at the end of the session um, as well. Um, so this, this session is definitely going to be helpful for whether it's a student, staff, or administrator, or dining services, whoever, or even a community um, community partner. Anyone can get um, quite a bit out of this info session, hopefully. Um, so to get started, I think it's really important to understand the big picture um, of what the Campus Kitchens Project is really all about. So we're going to touch a little bit on each of the basic components of a Campus Kitchen and really how it came to be. Um, to set some context, um, we're going to start with the issue that first led to the idea and the creation of the Campus Kitchens Project over 12 years ago. Um, that issue is clearly hunger and food waste in America. So um, you know, food insecurity and hunger is clearly a national need and something that's seen in almost every community. Um, though it might look different on the surface depending on where you're living um, and have different faces, it's probably undoubtedly something that your community faces. Um, and I'm sure you probably heard similar facts and statistics. Um, like you can see on the screen now. Um, one in six Americans, one in four children don't know where their next meal might be coming from, and that um, added together is over 50 million Americans are living in food insecure households. Um, yet at the very same time, we have about 40% of the food in the U.S. is wasted each year along um, uh, the food waste stream. So it's just costing Americans you know, billions of dollars each year in wasted resources. Um, kind of another factor at play <clears throat> is um, the idea of, of academic institutions and the idea of service within those. Um, so across the country today, we have the, a generation of young adults um, that are you know, the most engaged in service that has ever existed um, to date. Or about 90% of incoming college freshmen have already been engaged in some sort of community service prior to college, and they really understand the importance um, and see the value of service as a part um, of their academic experience. Um, and then at the same time, about 90% of most campuses include something about civic engagement or service as part of their mission statement. And again, really see the value of having that be a part of their students' experience through their, through their, um, their college or high school years. Um, so we know that college students really want to give back um, and serve, but they also really want to you know, see the impact of what they're doing. It's, it's not okay just to do a service opportunity and not really understand why or see um, the, the impact of their work. They really want to be able to see that they're affecting change within their communities. So another factor, um, to kind of again continue to set the context here, um, are just untapped resources. So these students that we're talking about reside in over 4,000 colleges and universities across the country. Um, and nearly every single one of those schools has um, the following same things, which one, one is um, you know, an on-campus kitchen space that's not utilized or either underutilized at certain hours of the day. Um, we have various quantities of surplus food um, from dining halls, which is part of that 40% waste um, that you referenced earlier. Um, we have these active and engaged students um, that are interested in getting real life marketable skills and experience during college as well as you know, that idea of giving back and, and contributing um, through service. And then lastly, clearly the, the, the universities are set in a community and, and the community themselves are the ones that understand their needs best and better than anyone else. Um, so let's kind of put these ideas together of this, the national food security need. Um, we have the active and engaged student body. Um, we have these untapped resources on our campuses. And so within that kind of interplay and mix of factors is exactly where the idea of the Canvas Kitchens Project was born. Um, so meeting needs by utilizing excess um, is a pretty simple idea and it makes a lot of sense. Um, and here at the Canvas Kitchens Project, we feel like we found really the most effective and impactful way to make that happen on your campus. All right, so let's talk a little bit about our philosophy in general. Um, so those who founded the Canvas Kitchens Project um, realized that they really that they could put all of these pieces together. Um, 
that student leaders could recover food that would otherwise be going to waste and put their university dining halls um, to use after hours to then feed those who are struggling with food, um, food insecurity in their communities. And so in addition to creating this really lean kind of operating model, um, we're also teaching students to see wasted resources as um, solutions to community issues. Um, so you know, the philosophy is pretty simple. We believe that hunger is a serious problem, but we also believe that the solution to that problem lies um, far beyond just food or just handouts, really kind of a top-down approach. Um, we believe that the answer um, clearly lies in something more systemic, um, systemic change and, and, and community partners that are built, that are built upon um, existing assets in the community. Um, so we believe, and we can find those kind of, uh, that kind of leadership and those type, those type of partnerships um, within our nation's schools, um, within those untapped assets that we just were talking about. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the basics of a campus kitchen. And I'm going to go through kind of what it looks like each day. So um, currently in 34 schools across the country, um, Dining Services designates unused kitchen space um, either on or near campus um, to be shared um, or used during off hours. So then um, last year alone we had almost 6,000 volunteers contribute nearly 80,000 hours of service um, within their campus kitchens. So students could contribute to the program in a variety of capacities, whether that be from um, creating and delivering meals as volunteers or to guiding the, 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 the program itself as members of the leadership team. Um, so those students take the recovered food from dining halls, food banks, grocery stores, even farmers markets and farms and store it on their on-campus kitchens. Um, last year alone, our schools recovered over 70, 750,000 pounds of food that would otherwise have uh, gone to waste completely. So then with that food, the students take part in cooking shifts either two to five times a week um, to prepare and repackage um, the donated food into balanced, nutritious meals. Um, and again, last year alone, our schools were able to prepare over 280,000 meals um, that are then uh, transported, deli delivered, and, or served to community partners um, in, their, in their specific communities and even to individuals in need. So whether that be in shelters, after school programs, low-income housing complexes. Um, and, and again, last year alone, our campus kitchens across the network fed over 9,000 clients and, uh, and worked with over 160 agencies, um, that's adding you know, nearly $750,000 of economic value, value back into the communities that we serve across the country. Um, so you can see just by this quick graphic the impact that we have by the numbers, um, and, and it's fairly immense, but, but here at Campus Kitchens, we know we're not just talking about numbers and we're not just talking about meals. Um, and we do always say that we're never going to feed our way out of hunger, and then food is clearly not going to be the only answer to this problem. Um, so the, at Campus, uh, here at TKP, we really encourage all of our students at our schools to think about using their quote-unquote food as a tool. Um, to enter into deeper relationships with the clients that they're serving. Um, so there are clearly are underlying root causes of hunger that might have nothing to do with actually being hungry. Um, and these needs need to be addressed along with also meeting the immediate needs with food. Um, so by starting with meals, our students are able to get their foot in the door and start relationships with the clients that they serve. So eventually they can learn um, about the other needs that they might have. Um, so and once those needs have been then identified by the clients themselves, the students can help in creating community-focused programs to meet those needs that are really tailored specifically um, to their community and, the, and those clients specifically, um, clearly with the client input and, and their collaboration at every step along the way. Um, so some kind of good examples to kind of actually tangibilize you know, what, um, this, what this looks like on the ground um, are We'll go through a couple categories, but the first one is nutrition education. Um, clearly, it makes sense since we're talking about food already to go dig a little bit deeper um, by doing nutrition education lessons with the with the uh, clients that we work with. So, you know, students can can create and even conduct their their classes for youth, for families, seniors alike, um, focusing on the specific health needs and concerns um, related um, to hunger and food insecurity. So some do you know, SNAP outreach, so getting individuals eligible for food benefits. Um, some do demos at farmers markets, um, so they can learn how to actually cook healthy um, and affordable meals. Um, they'll do nutrition classes, um, just so people can be educated on healthy eating, eating habits. We, we actually have just recently created a uh, nutrition education cu curriculum along with the Excel Foundation that we provide to all of our um, schools that are interested in, in starting a nutrition education program with um, the clients that they serve. Another kind of category of this kind of beyond meal kind of programming um, are working with community gardens or community farms. 
Um, so we have um, a large number of campus kitchens that have either chose to create um, their own or partner with an on or off campus garden or farm, which has multiple benefits, um, including not only you know, increasing the amount of fresh produce they can use in their own meals that they serve their clients, but it also gardens and farms provide you know, a, 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 an amazing kind of platform for um, education and just connecting with, with the partners that they serve so that you know, seniors or youth can come, that they're serving meals to can come and help, um, not only help with, with the garden or farm, but also learn about where, you know, where food comes from and how food grows. Um, to kind of continue the education, um, you know, educational process. All right. Um, some campus kitchens focus on um, economic empowerment types of programming. Um, so some lead culinary job training programs where they're getting members of their community certified in kitchen and food safety so they can enter into the restaurant industry, restaurant uh, hospitality industry. Um, we have some campus kitchens that are brought um, on farmers markets or CSA drop-off sites to their campus, which create just more selling points for local farmers. Um, we also have some campus kitchens that work um, to create food hubs that really expand the consumer market for local farmers in their community. And then again, kind of lumping all the rest into one category, any sort of community development um, that can happen within within um, within the specific communities that our campus kitchens work. So it can be you know, working with seniors to do health and wellness classes, um, working a lot of different intergenerational service projects um, are happening with our campus kitchens. We do we do after school programs if we're working with youth or doing tutoring, doing backpack programs for students that might need meals on the weekends, um, or even doing community dinners where they bring. Um, students can, you know, serve and share a meal with those in their community um, that, you know, might be a specific population like veterans or homeless. And so the, the main point being that, you know, these types of programs um, are you know, created out of, um, you know, the specific needs of the clients that are, that are already being served through meals. And so that, you know, it's the, the programs are always going to be unique um, to that specific school and that specific um, community. Um, all right. So let's look quickly, kind of um, on a another main uh, or important um, kind of outcome of the Campus Kitchens project, and something that you know is all again always been an outcome, but is now becoming more of a focus of what we do is is the student leadership development piece. So these students that we'll talk we'll talk a little bit more about this in depth in a bit, but these students that are especially the ones running uh, the Campus Kitchen on the leadership team are gaining, you know, just kind of invaluable. Um, experience that not only helps them in the classroom um, through a lot of service learning um, collaboratives, but also after they graduate. Um, they're able to provide, they're able to come to, to the table with a lot of really marketable um, and, re and job, re and job related, relevant skills um, that they can bring into the marketplace with no, no matter where they really go after college. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're in essence running a nonprofit for, for those however many years that they're working with the Campus Kitchen. So um, not only you know, are they leading their peers, but they are, you know, potentially balancing budgets or writing grants or um, managing volunteers or, you know, con you know doing large-scale events, um, the, the different kind of things that, that, are, that are really um, uh, great for students to have, you know, al alongside of their, um, you know, educational in-the-classroom experiences. All right. So now we've kind of done a brief overview of the Campus Kitchens project um, at large. We'll talk. We'll shift over kind of to how to actually bring this to um, your school. So how to actually start this on your campus. Um, we have created a really a very streamlined process uh, for schools to follow to hopefully make this process as easy as possible. Um, we have broken down the planning into. Um, four major categories, as you'll see on the screen now, which one is general school support, one is student support, one is dining support, and one is community support. Um, we're going to take a look, um, and, and, and clearly, you know, all four of these kind of pillars of sorts are necessary to, to bring a campus kitchen to a school. Um, how it actually happens might look differently, and we'll talk a little bit about that when we look into the specifics. Um, but without one of these, it's just clearly not going to be a, a strong campus kitchen if there's not support within those categories. Um, so we're going to take a look at each group, and then after I explain a little bit about each group, I'll give you a next step to kind of start, you know, start the process on your campus so you can really get started right away. Um, and these next steps are really just the first step of um, part of our brand new online tool called the Campus Kitchen Planner, um, which you can find on our website. Um, and I'll go over a little bit more later in the presentation. 
that was created um, to lay out all of the necessary steps that, that you know, a school or students must go through to ensure that they'll be ready to support their campus kitchen at their school. Um, the planner will go much more in depth into each of these categories we're about to cover, um, and it should definitely be the kind of the home base for the team that's planning um, the campus kitchen at um, your university or at your school. All right, so let's jump right in to um, school support. Um, so having the support of your school might not seem like the most important or the factor that comes you know, first in your head, um, but it can really help when you're trying to create and sustain your campus kitchen. It can make it that much um, easier when you have their support. So each campus kitchen at the very least needs what we call a sponsoring office, um, which is just a, really a place for the campus kitchen to call home as, if, as any other you know, service related program would. Um, so this usually or typically falls under an office of service, service learning, civic engagement, um, whatever that might be called on your campus. Um, it also might fall under campus ministry um, or even an academic department such as social work, nutrition, culinary arts, or even the business school. Um, some schools throughout their program through a class and use their professor as a sponsor. Um, you know, this group, whoever it may be, are really going to be the first group you need to reach out to. Um, and you need, um, you know, along with connecting with other students and programs and, and other staff members, but you know, pinpointing what office on campus um, is really going to be um, you know, the main sponsor of, of the campus kitchen. And the reason for this is and we've seen over the years that having a you know, stable place on campus um, for the campus kitchen to really reside helps with the overall sustainability of the program in the long run. Um, you know, aside from having the sponsoring office, and we have many tools on the Campus Kitchen Planner that can kind of help guide, you know, which which office might be the best. We have some feasibility tools to really see if if this person or this place really makes the most sense for the Campus Kitchen, um, what what its needs are, and if they can really be met through that office or that person. Um, but aside from having the sponsoring office, you know, fostering it. Uh, you know, a variety of support on campus through other staff and administra administrative support um, is, is really crucial. So in the, in the, in the beginning stages um, of Plan A Campus Kitchen, it really is just about reaching out as, as, as widely as possible to see who might be interested. Um, you know, talking to the president or provost or even dean of students if you have a connection with them immediately can be, can sometimes be a good idea. You know, talking with just multiple staff and multiple faculty um, across, across the board that might be, um, that might be interested and not limiting your limiting yourself to just the typical you know staff or departments that you think might be interested so not just reaching out to just the nutrition department but reaching out to you know if you're a communications or PR person reaching out to your your uh, your faculty and staff within your department just to kind of or environmental studies or whatever your it might be just kind of gauge interest because you never you never really know what kind of support or what they might be able to bring to the table even if they aren't going to be your sponsor um, a lot of campus kitchens have what we call an advisory board or an advisory team, which is full of, you know, the, all those different staff and, and faculty and, and administrator folks, but even folks from the community that want to, you know, help to be a part of the, the campus kitchen, but maybe, you know, from a planning standpoint, or maybe they can help with, with funding or with, uh, with events. So, so again, keeping your eyes and, and mind open to anyone that really wants to be involved at this point is, is really to your benefit. And also to make a note that, um, you know, as you make relationships with those, with, with, with anyone, especially faculty and staff, but realizing that at the end of the day, um, someone from your university or college administration is going to be the one signing the contract um, to make the agreement official and to join our network. So having, you know, continually try to see if you can get folks that, that might be able to connect you with, with those that are going to be able to make that final um, decision at the end is always really helpful. Um, so clearly the next step, which I already kind of talked about, is meeting with your potential sponsoring offices on campus or even pinpointing which ones might be um, uh, promising and then setting up some meetings just to pitch the idea of the campus kitchen to them. And within the planner we have some great kind of pitching tools or documents and resources to help you kind of come to the table with an educated um, stance on, on what you're trying to say and, and letting them know that you know, you're coming with the backing of a national organization that's been around for over a decade and has a following of you know, 30 plus schools across the country that have been doing this exact thing. And so knowing that, you know, that it's not just you coming with this crazy new idea that you want to do, but you have, you know, again, the support of, 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 of a national organization and staff to help do this entire process is really key. Okay. So we will quickly make sure I'm great. All right. Um, move on to student support. 
Um, and students clearly are at the core of every Canvas Kitchen, and they um, are really the driving force of what a Canvas Kitchen is all about. Um, they can students can hold a variety of roles within a Canvas Kitchen. So, um, you know, having a really strong leadership team um, is really key, not only during the planning process, but also clearly once your Canvas Kitchen is up and running. And so, a leadership team is just a group of you know five to ten students. Um, that they are really the ones that oversee not only the day-to-day -day operations of the Canvas Kitchen, but really the, the long-term goals um, and kind of drive of, of where they want their Canvas Kitchen to go. Um, leadership team is not, you know, it's there typically is you know one student coordinator, one student leader, but then everyone else on the leadership team does have this specific role or duty. You know, so you know it might be someone oversees. The cooking operations in the kitchen, or someone oversees PR and can, you know, and managing their on-campus relationships, or someone might be a volunteer coordinator. One might manage their client relations outside of campus. Um, so, kind of having that um, those specific duties um, and responsibilities defined would make make a really strong leadership team. Oftentimes, the leadership team can come from you know a class, like I mentioned earlier, um, a specific department, an existing club organization that might want to take on this 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 project. Um, but it can also just be recruited in general. Just if you have, you know, a bunch of do some general recruitment on campus, or if you have a bunch of your friends that might are interested in the similar things, getting them involved um, and, and having them, you know, first and foremost, even inviting them to join your Canvas Kitchen Planner. Um, you can invite all of your leadership team, or actually anyone who's interested, to join and to come see and be a part of the planner in the planning process. Um, uh, clearly, aside from just a leadership team, your students also have to be the volunteer base of your Canvas Kitchen. So, you know, the physical manpower running those those cooking operations and the deliveries and the food recovery. Um, you know, so you know, the, aside from the fact of of getting just a strong leadership team, which is which is important um, in the very beginning, you have to start thinking about you know where am I going to get my larger groups of volunteers? So, working through. Um, you know, offices, the Office of Service, or even through Greek Life or other or other clubs, uh, service-oriented clubs that might um, not be able to pull upon a larger base of volunteers. Um, you know, students have the opportunity to you know work their way up um, in terms of leadership. So, getting students, you know, as they're coming into college as just being volunteers and then you know maybe leading one one shift a week their next year and then maybe becoming part of the leadership team and then eventually maybe running the entire campus kitchen is the kind of the ideal scenario of of kind of keeping students going through this process so that there are no gaps um, gaps in service or gaps in leadership um, let this go there we go um, talking a little bit about leadership um, in terms of the structures that many campus kitchens have um, each program, like I said, has a student coordinator, regardless of other leadership about that, um, and they're you know in charge of reporting and oversight um, and, and kind of again just relaying information to our national office. Um, but some schools, so some schools are completely student run um, with just that those student coordinators and then that sponsor or advisor that I spoke about earlier. Um, other schools do have some sort of part time staff involved that they might have an AmeriCorps Vista, a grad assistant, or just a staff person that might be. Um, you know, helping to assist the student coordinators and the student leadership team just a little bit further. Um, and then we have some schools that um, either have you know seen the value of the program or it's just been around so long on their campus that they see that they decide to institutionalize a position on their campus to really lead and head um, the campus kitchen. And, and again, there is going to still be a student leadership team, still probably be a student leader or student coordinator, but having that um, kind of full-time staff to help navigate through some of the the you know bureaucracy of of, of university or college um, environments can be really helpful and then clearly if you have a full-time staff that can be dedicated um, to the program they can grow and do kind of other programs that maybe just a student run Canvas Kitchen could not. But um, but I say that that we have equally strong programs that are student led that are staff led. Um, it really just depends on, on your campus. Um, since we're talking a little bit about the day-to-day -day of a Canvas Kitchen and the students, I thought it'd be good to kind of just give you an example of what a typical week in a typical Canvas Kitchen might look like. Um, clearly, this is adaptable to every scenario. It's not going to look like this at every campus, but to give kind of a, a, a brief look of uh, at what kind of happens on a, on a typical week. Um, there's a lot of moving parts, um, including you know coordinating with your food donors, your, which could be dining services or else else outside of campus, coordinating with students. They're actually doing the cooking and then coordinating with your clients that you're delivering to. So um, we'll notice first all the food recovery shifts that are in green. Um, can happen 
by food recovery, I mean you know recovering the wasted food, um, whether that be from on campus on your dining halls or off campus, um, restaurants, supermarkets, farms, any of those kind of places. Um, it takes you know about two to four volunteers, depending on where you're going. Um, Oftentimes, sometimes dining services will bring all of their leftover food from their multiple dining halls to one central location um, where that, that food is then stored, labeled and stored properly to be either used you know, that day or that week or you know, if you have freezer space frozen to be used later. Um, next you'll notice in blue um, we have the cooking shifts which can again either happen the day of um, a food recovery shift. If you're kind of, if you have a really uh, efficient system and be able to bring and have pretty consistent food donations coming in, or um, cooking can also happen, you know, after um, if you have a pretty good stockpile or have a good freezer and, and things that you can pull from um, to create those meals. So the cooking shift, um, it can look a lot of different ways um, depending on your campus kitchen and what kind of donations you're you're getting in. So if you are a campus kitchen that relies heavily upon, you know, the prepared food that's being donated from your dining hall. A lot of your quote-unquote cooking might more might look more like repackaging and repurposing that food. Uh, you know, if you get a pan of lasagna, you don't really have to really cook that. It's more just portioning it, portioning it, and putting it into either you know, individual containers or bringing it as is to a congregate style type of meal. Um, if you're getting a lot of fresh produce or getting a lot of raw product, um, there might be more actual stretch, scratch cooking involved to create, or in a lot, and oftentimes it's a combination of the two. So you know, maybe you'll get a you know again a main entree or protein that's already created already um, prepared through dining services, but then you might um, you know cook from scratch the different sides or some vegetables or, or, or things like that. Um, and it is oftentimes you know a game of chance, um, and, and I think students tend to really think that's an actually an exciting part of working at a campus kitchen is putting together these meals on a daily or weekly basis um, that are you know well balanced and nutritious. So, and then the final part you can see in red are the delivery shifts. So um, those again can either occur after a day after the cooking shift, or either or either or you know, the same day right after you prepare. Kind of depending on your clients, and also um, you know clearly there's there's safety measures that need to be taken if if you are delivering um, day after you have to um, clearly cool down all your food and store it, and then deliver it cold. Um, mostly to individuals. That's typically how it works. Uh, if you have individual clients, if you do serve, you know. Maybe you have a community dinner where you're serving that meal hot um, to a group of people. You would definitely be um, either reheating it on location or just taking it straight from when you were cooking it straight to your delivery um, within the proper time frame. Um, so yeah, that is a quick kind of rundown um, of, of just, again just a kind of a typical um, schedule um, of sorts uh, for uh, for a campus kitchen kind of look at the next step. Um, clearly the next step for student support is to establish a student leadership team. None of this, none of these logistics of, of setting an operation schedule or doing any of these things can happen without a strong group of students that are um, committed to this project. So getting them on board, getting them within in the planner, kind of seeing what's available um, is really the first step that needs to happen. You can, again, look at getting a class or a club to sponsor um, what you've done or just, again, general recruitment of, of, of students. All right, we're going to move on to the third kind of category, which is dining. Um, I think dining support clearly is an, another crucial component, just because of what they're bringing to the table, um, which is um, you know food and oftentimes space and expertise. Um, and and, it, and I think a lot of people, this is the one that's the most unknown because it's most the average student or staff may not be very um, you know understand fully what dining service is about and when how they can help and what they can do. Um, so generally, they're going to provide a few key things. Um, again, in an ideal situation, they're going to provide you know their idle kitchen space or either part of their kitchen space um, that you can utilize during you know when they're not using the kitchen at all, or even when it's just non-peak hours. So when they might they might just be preparing their meals as well, um, but students aren't actually coming through for meals. Um, they also ideally would be able to provide some sort of types of storage for the campus kitchen. Um, it varies in the in the amounts depending on the school and the relationship with the dining service provider. But in an ideal scenario, they would have some dry storage space, some cooler space, and some freezer space to be able to keep some of their food, um, so they can be more flexible in the meals and types of meals that they produce. Um, also, they're clearly going to be providing donated leftover food from their meal service. Um, again, in varying amounts, and the amount that you know they provide. Will really dictate you know other donors that you'll need to reach out to in in the community and I mean I think most of our campus kitchens have a good balance and I think it it makes it 
for it makes for better and you know, well balanced meals if you have a variety of donors and not just your your dining hall, but also you know a supermarket or a farm or a farmers market or maybe a, another restaurant um, that can provide some kind of variety for the types of foods that you're getting in. And then oftentimes dining staff also um, also can act as kind of kitchen safety support, um, sort of doing you know maybe once a semester trainings or just you know be on call. Um, and by no means do they have to do this as their full-time job, and we'll talk a little bit more why that isn't the case, but you know, a lot of times dining service staff get really invested in the campus kitchen, and they see the value of the work that they're doing and being able to partner with, with the students and the school at large sometimes is, is something that's really unique um, for not only the individual staff, but you know, the, the dining service provider at, at large. Um, so, you know, dining service support, though, especially initially, can oftentimes be one of the more difficult components due to just the many, um, you know, the fact that many dining service staff may have initial concerns about, you know, donation liability, kitchen safety hazards, those types of things. Um, but CKP, Campus Kitchens Project, has provided, um, through the planner and, and, and through our support, a lot of different um, tools and resources for you to really hopefully pitch the idea, especially on the initial pitch, with a lot of educated, with a lot of education behind it so that they, you can kind of hopefully breach some of their initial concerns. We basically, we basically know all the questions that they're going to be asking and so hopefully we can provide you with some of the answers on, on the front end so you're able to really, you know, initially answer some of those, those, those questions that they might have concerns about. So clearly liability is always going to come up um, in this conversation. So, and it's always good to, again, um, well, it's good to focus on or see if they are even familiar with the national legislation that's in place. Um, so the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Food Donation Act um, is you know, national legislation since 1996 that pre protects all those, including universities or schools or colleges, who donate leftover food in quote unquote good faith to needy individuals in their community. Um, you know, they're well, they might be aware of this and and or they might not, but it's a great kind of foundation or baseline, um, you know, coverage to this is national legislation to make sure that they do realize that this is something that is legal and that is, um, and that they can be participating in. Um, so on, kind of on top of that, the Campus Kitchens Project takes measures that go far beyond, you know, necessary industry standards um, to really encourage the proper safety um, and sanitation of the operations that the students are working in, especially when they're in the kitchen. Um, so we have, alongside of a leading um, dining service provider, created our own kitchen safety paperwork system called HACCP, which is Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points. Um, what this does is this tracks our food um, from in the door, through, through the cooking process, through out the door to our clients to really allow for safe time and temperature procedures um, to be taken. Um, and it's these kind of systems, because um, we realize we're dealing with volunteers, we're not dealing with professional chefs, but it's these kind of systems um, that we use when handling food that makes sure that we're handling it in, in that quote unquote good faith that keeps us protected by the by the by the Food Donation Act. Um, on top of that, we require that students on the leadership team or those that are leading any shifts within the kitchen be surf safe certified. And what a surf safe certification is, it's an online certification that anyone working within um, the restaurant or hospitality industry, anyone who's handling food, um, even those that are working in the dining service at your school will have a surf safe certification. So we require that our students that are you know, leading those shifts or leading, leading the volunteers on a regular basis also have that knowledge of food safety and food handling. Um, so they're able to um, you know, bring that knowledge to the volunteers or, and just also have, be able to oversee and have some, you know, oversee a shift to make sure that the food is being handled in the safest way possible. Um, and then I mentioned this already, but last but not least, it's really important to to point out, especially to dining services and even to the university at large, that you know, in our in in our network's existence over the past 12 years, there's not been a single instance of food-related um, you know uh, liability or food-related you know issues because of um, regarding you know client food safety um, because of these measures that we're taking that again go far beyond what a typical maybe restaurant would do in terms of reporting and and tracking um, of the, of, the, of the food coming in and of the food going out. Um, so I think. That's just something, you know, and there's lots more of this kind of information and lots, you know, it, uh, clearly explained in more depth on the planner, especially regarding the Good Samaritan Food Act, the Food Donation Act, and other, um, you know, explaining our paperwork system a little more in depth. It's all on the planner um, for when, um, when you really do have this, uh, that meeting with dining services. So, and I would say that it really, though this is important, I think it's important first to have a really strong group of you know, student leaders and even staff 
um, and faculty. So having your leadership team kind of formulated or formed, and then having also you know a sponsor or other staff that are so in support of this program when you go to meet with dining services, because nothing looks worse than um, you know going to this meetings maybe one or two you one or two students and not really knowing what you're talking about, and it just doesn't put on a good first impression. Um, so again, reminding them that you're coming from with the backing of a national organization, and here's the, the team um, that you have formulate, formed here, um, and then kind of begin to pitch this idea um, to your dining service provider. And it's really good to reach out first to the dining service director or manager rather than going maybe to maybe you have a friend that works in the in the dining hall, and that's great. Maybe they can connect you, but they're not the ones that are going to ultimately make this decision of, what, of whether they can work with, with work with us or not. So it's important to to reach for the top first and hopefully get a meeting with them. And we have relationships on a national network, uh, national scope with um, many of the national dying service providers. Um, so oftentimes we can be helpful in facilitating some of those connections or even pushing them forward depending on, on, the, on the provider as well. All right, so the final um, piece is community support. And I think this, this is really, really important um, because the Canvas Kitchens Project really, provi um, really prides itself um, and being a community-focused program. What, regardless if it is on campus or not, it is a community-focused program. Um, and every campus kitchen, you know, needs to really fully assess their community and identify, you know, not only the needs, but also the existing assets that they can utilize when working their campus kitchen partnerships. Um, so your campus kitchen will need to identify and pick community partners to deliver those meals to, like we talked about briefly in the operations plan. And, and, and I, we really encourage that those relationships be First, meeting meeting um, the needs and, and, and not overlapping services, but meeting kind of those gaps in services, but also really focusing on having those relationships be mutually beneficial. Um, you know, making it that you know those that you're serving can also provide things um, to your campus kitchen and, and to the students, because having that kind of relationship, I think, makes the program as strong as it can be. It makes its impact really, really great. Um, so, yeah, having. Having you know that in the forefront of of your planning and realizing that you know you really want to focus on assets rather than just you know coming in and saying here's our idea of what we want to do, but um, like I mentioned um, before with our programs, having the clients or having the community really have um, the first say and, and be take lead in what they what they want and what they need because they're the ones that know it best, um, and that's the way I think uh, some of our most successful campus kitchens are able to really thrive. Um, so we have some great tools again on the planner. If you're kind of at a starting point of, you know, how do I? I don't even know our, our community that well. What are the needs? What's what's already what's already present? We have some great, you know, asset mapping and asset inventory t um, tools to help you kind of start that process um, with your team. And I also think it makes a lot of sense to also piggyback off of um, existing services that your that your school is already providing to the community. So let's say that you have a big brother big sister mentoring program already that's facilitated um, through you know a campus your campus service office. Um, it'd be great to approach maybe the Boys, or, Boys and Girls Club or whatever you know organi youth organization you're working with and say, hey, we're already providing these, um, you all with mentors and tutors um, from our school. Would you also like us to provide meals or snacks for your after school program? Um, so hopefully there's already a good relationship that's in place so that you can just kind of piggyback along side of, of, of the, the, the services that are already be being provided. So that's, that's a lot, oftentimes what I will say if, if uh, schools don't really know who they want to serve. Uh, but oftentimes they come to the table, you know, that their clients, the, the, one, they, the impetus of starting the program oftentimes comes from them seeing the need and having a pretty good idea of who they want to serve. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about the logistics uh, of the program as we kind of come to nearing the end of this. Um, talk a little bit about cost and benefits. Um, of the Canvas Kitchen. So startup costs for a Canvas Kitchen can be very, very low um, when, when in an ideal scenario materials and supplies are shared or donated in kind, whether it be from um, dining services or elsewhere. Uh, most kitchens you know, get their disposables or hard materials like pots and pans and things donated directly from or able to use um, you know, those at, on their on-campus kitchen within dining services. Um, so usually the investment costs on those kind of things are very low and might just be you know, insulated bags or you know, transportation for transportation. Um, again, and I'm, sorry, I'm just showing this new on the screen, the, the costs um, breakdown. You notice that you know, it shows a, a monetary amount, but also either or could be in-kind donations, so kind of looking at that. Um, yeah, so hard, hard materials and pantry supplies. Some people buy basic pantry items. 
um, you know, such as staple goods, but they're always going to use like spices and salt and pepper and, and, and oil like that. So there are some, some really small costs for that to kind of stock their pantry. Um, but often those can be donated, you know, through can drives or other drives on campus. There are some ongoing costs related to you know kind of running any organization on campus. You know, kind of some admin costs or some campus kitchens also do purchase some food through maybe a food bank or a food hub um, that to really ensure that they're doing balanced meals. We, we think it's really important to not just, you know, donate food directly as is, but be able to provide something that's really, you know, substantial, nutritious, nutritious and balanced um, to the clients that we're serving, especially if we're serving clients like youth or older adults that could be susceptible um, to, to disease more so than others. Um, there is an affiliation fee with joining our network um, that I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a moment. So I'm not glancing it over. I'm not glazing over that, but I will go back to that in just a moment. But it's an annual affiliation fee um, that I can talk a little bit more about what you receive from that. Um, and then, op, you know, optional costs, other types of programming. If you do, um, a lot of campus kitchens do interns um, or, you know, other kinds of random costs. Um, but again, there's, there's a budget tool on the planner that breaks it down much, much better than, than this slide into individual um, costs. That, 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 one, that one campus kitchen might incur. But I would say many of our campus kitchens run on a very limited budget um, because they don't need to because they're getting all those things donated or they're able to, you know, there's, there's just not many costs involved on the day to day. So let's talk a little bit about um, kind of what we provide as a network, which I think is really important, especially um, when we start talking about having, you know, paying to be affiliated with us. Many people ask, well, what, well, what do you provide or what is your, what is your value? Um, so I think that's important to really hit on this. And we provide, um, first of all, program support. So you get support not only through the planning process from our staff, but also once you become a Canvas Kitchen, you have a full-time program manager that's designated to your program. So especially in those early years, you have someone who, um, typically who has been working in a Canvas Kitchen in the field and also managing other Canvas Kitchens for years and really know um, how to answer a lot of those you know, initial questions that, that students and staff might have about how to run and really grow their program. We also do an initial setup visit. So we come, a staff person comes when you're ready to actually start and launch your Canvas Kitchen um, to make sure everything is, 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 is um, running in accordance to what we know is going to be really effective um, for the program. We also do monthly network webinars and trainings and provide just a wealth of resources and materials and best practices because, again, we've been doing this for so long that we really know the best way of doing um, a lot of different things um, that Canvas Kitchens wants to do. I think um, on that same vein, skipping over briefly, but for in terms of best practices, we provide um, two national events or, or gatherings each year, one being a boot camp, which we um, encourage all Canvas Kitchen, new Canvas Kitchens and old to send their new leaders um, for a few days to basically learn everything they need to know, including our paperwork system and um, really to keep uh, up, to, up to speed on, you know, best practices within the, within the field and within the industry um, and getting those, those students ready to really, um, you know, jump right into the year. So that's always in the summer. And then we also hold a national conference in the spring where they bring, again, bring together our network and also out, uh, tons of outside partners to, again, um, that are really leaders in the, in the field of, of hunger and food waste um, to, to um, keep, our, keep our network um, really on the cutting edge of what, of what we're doing. We also provide, um, we have a CKP pantry, which has all of our, all of our resources um, that are online for our campus kitchens to use at any time, which including, includes our you know, paperwork system that I referenced earlier that um, we use within the kitchen to keep things safe. We also have, you know, uh, support via technology and marketing, so email and website and social media support and lots of you know, national and local publicity. But I think one of our greatest values that we provide and it's becoming more and more of a value um, you know, each year is our financial and in-kind resources. So we provide, you know, um, and as of lately we've been doing many different startup grants um, and even ongoing grants. So grant opportunities um, for new schools and schools already in our networks to um, you know, either focus on extending their program to different populations or working on you know, extending their program into different seasons or, else, or even just to get your campus kitchen off the ground. So we're able to you know, leverage a lot of our national partners to then subgrant out um, these different um, these funds to our campus kitchens to keep them operating and, and growing and moving forward. We also do um, an, on, an annual online fundraising competition that we support um, through that all of our campus kitchens can participate in as well as um, you know doing 
you know, different kind of grant ma ma grant matches and internship opportunities, and just ca and kind of leveraging any kind of national, local um, grant opportunities that that might be helpful for that campus kitchen. And so something I think to really look at uh, that we've just started to dive into and are going to do a lot more of are these um, startup grant competitions. And this is what's really pertinent to um, probably a lot of you on the phone that are wanting to start a Canvas Kitchen and might not know if you can you know, have the funds um, to do so. We are providing or just completed this um, first round of this and are going to do um, another one coming up in a few months. But this online video grant competitions, as you can see on the screen right now, um, schools qualify for the competition by um, completing certain um, tasks on the Canvas Kitchen Planner, uh, mostly these gaining support from the major four groups that I talked about earlier. So getting a letter of support from your school, or your sponsoring office, from your students, from your dining hall director, and also having your administration um, look over and sign the intent to sign of, of our contract um, that we provide. So once the, the schools have qualified, they provide us a short video, um, which basically explains the need in their community and why they feel like a Canvas Kitchen would benefit um, or you know, address that need. And then we just open up um, for a week the a public vote. And um, you know, students and those schools really try to get out the vote as much as possible within their school and their community. And then the top five winners, or top five uh, yeah, schools with the highest number of votes for, um, in this competition, they each received a $5,000 startup grant. Um, so this is just one example of, 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 of something that we are going to be doing a lot more of um, as we continue to grow. Um, we have another competition that's going to be happening in the fall. Um, and um, schools are already beginning to qualify for that. So if that's something you're interested in, you can let me know. And I can get you the, more of the information of how to actually start qualifying um, for these competitions. All right, coming to the last little portion, just the actual process um, of if you're starting from the very beginning, the very first thing you need to do if you're interested, um, even right now you can do is to get, fill out our simple intake getting started form and what, that's on the website right there at um, Start a Kitchen. Um, and that basically is just providing your name and basic information about your school and that will provide, that will give you access to the Canvas Kitchen Planner, which I've been referencing quite a bit. And I'm gonna just quickly jump to a, a couple screenshots of that so we can get a little look of that. But that basically, it breaks it down into the four categories that we just went over. As you can see, hopefully on your screen in a moment. Um, that we have the school support category, dining, student, and community. And within each of those you know, columns or pillars um, are um, tasks. So each of those cards is a specific task that when clicked and opened, um, it opens up a checklist of things that need to be completed. So whether that be just to read about or get more information about it, or actually to you know, complete um, a certain you know, form or document that needs to be completed um, in that task. You can, you notice that you can invite um, I mentioned before, invite your friends and other folks planning, your students and staff, to your Canvas Kitchen Planner. You can assign them specific tasks. Um, you can set due dates. You can communicate with them and even with me um, on each. Um, you see on the activity feed down here, you can type in questions or comments that will go straight to me or straight to your team. So you can really, just, everything is all in one place. You'll notice also they'll be referencing certain resources. So um, with if a certain card references you know, to read or download a certain resource, you just have to pull down the resources menu and they're all right there for you to click. Um, you know, if you open up operation schedule, then you can download the operation schedule worksheet and then fill that out and be able to upload that right to your Canvas Kitchen Planner. So you have everything you need all in one place. Um, it really is your home base for Canvas Kitchen for your whole planning process. And then after that, so when we set up the planner um, to the point that, you know, if you've completed every check, um, you know, every task and checked off every checklist within each task, but at the end of that, you're, you're fully ready to launch your Canvas Kitchen, and we're, we can rest assured in that. So the final step is really not much of a step at all. It's just um, to complete the final contract that's being signed and do a quick um, you know, readiness check with us over the phone, and then we're ready to you know, set a launch date where we can send the person from our staff to come and actually do your setup visit. Many Canvas Kitchens do a larger you know, celebration launch kind of a, event with, with media and other things to really celebrate um, the, the, the starting of their work that they're doing. All right, that is the, is, is the gist of it. Um, I am, again, am more than happy to take questions now from the chat box um, or um, over the phone, or you can clearly at any time reach out via email or giving me a call um, if you have any specific questions. Um, I would love to chat with you, and that's definitely part of my, um, oh, seeing what, what happens, oh, it's a great question. 
Um, Ryan asked what happens during the summer. Um, so uh, we, in the past, it's been a variety, it depends on the campus kitchen. Some have run operations through the summer, some haven't, but it's been a large push of ours from a national standpoint to get all of our campus kitchens running throughout the summer. Um, whether that be at, you know, exactly how it usually is or whether they kind of change their, their schedule a bit or maybe some of them just do certain types of programming or some might do you know, grocery bags instead of meals. We want something to be happening to kind of continue that relationship with the clients that they serve. Um, one of our grants that we have just recently um, awarded to a few of our schools within the network was specifically for um, amping up their summer operations. So it's providing um, you know, student, uh, student internships or student stipends for them to really get more, not only student volunteers, but also community volunteers to come in maybe when students aren't available. So reaching out to other folks in the community at churches or faculty and staff or maybe even with you know, other connections to, to make sure that the, the, the campus kitchen can really run and on um, all year long. So it's something that we each school does a little bit differently, but it's, um, we've seen every year an increasing, increasing number of our schools be able to operate during the summer, and that is the goal. Any other questions? You feel free, feel free if you need to type them in the chat box. And again, if not, I am always available via email or a phone. Um, if you're interested in, 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 in learning more about the Canvas Kitchen Planner, be sure to fill out the Getting Started form, which can be found on the website on the bottom of the screen. Um, and then you can, I can give you access, even if you're not sure if this is something you want to do, but just want to kind of look over the process. Um, by filling out the Getting Started form, by no means contractually, you know, keeps you in. You don't have to do anything with this, so it will just give you um, a good um, kind of overview of what the process looks like. Right. If there are no other questions, I will. Oops. Yes, uh, I, I should have mentioned that. Um, there will also be. Uh, I've recorded this this whole presentation, and I can send it to the attendees um, right after um, I process it this afternoon. So I can send um, a link to the YouTube video of this if you want to refer to any of these things. And I think there's also maybe an older one that's up on the planner as well if you want want to look at it right away. Um, but yeah, I will definitely send over um, a recording. And if you even want, if you want just the actual presentation, I can do that as well. If you want to use that to pitch, help pitch um, to people at your school, so I can do any either or. All right. Well, I appreciate everyone taking it about this hour to hang out, and I hope it was informative. And again, if you have any other questions, please let me know um, at any time. All right. Have a good rest of the afternoon. Thank you.